to, to hear what's going on and ask questions. OK, so first off, good morning, candidates and members of the public, and welcome to the virtual candidate workshop. My name is Monique De La Garza, and I'm the city clerk for the city of Long Beach. And today marks the first day of the nomination period for the primary nominating election that was called on October 26th by the city council. So all the information being presented can be found in the candidate handbook, and you will be picking that up with your nomination packet. So there's a lot of detail in that candidate handbook. I recommend everybody read it um, if you're planning on being a candidate and running for office. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat or raise your hand and we will ask questions after every uh, section that we go over. And I will not be going over every single section of the candidate handbook out of respect for people's time. Um, it would take us quite a long time to get through every single section. And I wanna make sure that everybody has an opportunity to listen to what we have to say and to ask questions and um, get out of here in a timely manner. So before we get started, I wanna introduce some members of my team and members of the Ethics Commission that are here today. Um, Tamla Austin is in the meeting and she is a crucial part of the elections team. She's a city clerk analyst and she will be assisting with the candidate nomination and helping everybody get through this uh, exciting process. There's also Allison Vilma, who is in the meeting, who is the assistant city clerk, and Philip uh, McGowan, who is going to be helping with campaign finance. So all those pesky campaign finance problems, Philip is your man. And JT Nagayama is also in the meeting and he is also a city clerk analyst who will be assisting should you have any questions. And I think Maggie um, Trinidad is also in the meeting and she is our matching funds expert. So if you have any questions about matching funds during the campaign cycle, Maggie will be able to help you as well as several other members of the team, but she is the person for matching funds. Right, I'd like to take this moment to introduce Margo Morales, who is the chair of the Ethics Commission, and Barbara Pollock, who is the vice chair of the Ethics Commission. You can go to the next slide, Pamela. And the next one. So you're gonna hear from the uh, chair and the vice chair of the Ethics Commission now. Um, but this, these are the topics that we'll be, we will be going over during the meeting. So contests and candidate qualifications, key dates, manila envelope and forms, candidate handbook and nomination papers, and mass mailings, political signs, and electioneering. After the candidate workshop, you can pick up your manila envelope and your candidate handbook. We strongly encourage you to make an appointment when you come down to pick up your papers so we can go over any questions you may have. And I will now turn it over to Chair Morales. Thank you very much. I want to first congratulate each of you on your decision to take this important step to providing leadership in our city. One of the first, let's go to the for next slide. The first topic that I'd like to discuss with you is who are we as the Ethics Commission? Measure CCC in 2018, approved by the voters of the city of Long Beach, established the Ethics Commission to monitor, administer, and implement government ethics in the city. And we've been working very hard over the last five years to advance public trust and confidence through education and the development of policies and processes that promote each of the city's values of accountability, fairness, impartiality, diversity, transparency, and integrity. Next slide, please. One of the first things that the commission undertook was a revamping and redevelopment of the city's code of conduct and ethics, which you will find on page 6.3 in the handbook. The code was updated by the commission and formally adopted by the city council in December of 20, 2022. It includes a value statement and principles that commit and encourage city employees and volunteers, including elected officials, 
to undertake their duties with the highest ethical principles play and place the public interest in the forefront. I want to note that this is not a requirement of you while you are a candidate, but the Ethics Commission strongly believes that the sooner you start showing a fidelity to the principles outlined in the Code of Conduct and Handbook, the more you will be able to integrate that ethical lens into everything that you do on your campaign. Next slide, please. And then on page 6-1 of your handbook, you will find a candidate pledge. While it's not required that you sign this, the Ethics Commission strongly believes that signing the pledge is, is a very strong message to the community of your, your desire to lead an ethical and fair campaign. So when you sign the pledge, you are pledging to an open and public campaign focused on issues. We believe focusing on issues is tantamount. The, the voters need to know where you stand on the issues that are important to the city, that you will not defame the character or make slanderous attacks on any of your opponents or their family. You will have no prejudicial actions or comments toward any person or organization on the basis of actual or perceived race, religious creed, color, national origin, ancestry, physical disability, mental disability, medical condition, marital status, age, sexual orientation, sex, including gender identity. You'll uphold our system of free elections. There'll be no coercion of employees to assist with or contribute to a campaign. You'll repudiate any action by your campaign staff, volunteers, or a third party campaign that violates any portion of the pledge. And finally, that you'll defend and uphold the right of every qualified American voter to full and equal participation in the electoral process. And then finally, I um, two last points. I want to let you know that in the last election cycle, cycle, there were some anomalies with some of the financial statements. And it was very disconcerting to the Ethics Commission to learn that those were raised by the general public reviewing them. So we have taken a vote and we'll be setting up in January an ad hoc group of a few of our members that will be taking the time every time you file a financial statement to review it, to make sure that it is in alignment with the city's rules and campaign policies. Um, and then I really want you to share this handbook and the pledge with your staff and teams you set the tenor for your campaign. It's vitally important that you set that high bar for your campaign of all of the things in the pledge and the code of conduct, because how your campaign is run and what your volunteers and your staff do comes from the messages, messages that you give them. And we are looking forward to a robust campaign season and wish each of you the best of luck as you move forward. Bobby, was there anything you wanted to add? Uh, I just want to encourage everyone during your campaign to talk about your personal commitment to the values and how, if elected, you would demonstrate that commitment. Uh, and I, I think that sets the right tone during the campaign and will bring you into uh, the, the uh, ethical management of, of government functions. Thank you Thank for the time to address you, Monique. Thank you for coming to speak to the candidates this morning. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this is an even district election. We're going to be having new council members for two, four, six, and eight, or say elections for two, four, six, and eight. Next slide. Here are some key dates to keep in mind for this election cycle. December 8th is the close of a nomination. And for those running for an elected office where an incumbent will not be filing, the period will be extended through Wednesday, December 13th. This is CD8 only. So all of the candidates, the close of your nomination will be December 8th. CD8, the close of your nomination 
will be December 13th. And then the most important day, March 5th, election day. Next slide. In your manila envelope, you get several forms. And I wanna talk about a couple of those forms that seem to generate the most questions every election cycle. The first one is your ballot designation worksheet. Your ballot designation is the title that will be printed under your name on the ballot, and it legally cannot be more than three words, and you must provide proof of your designation when you turn in your packet. In the past, proof has included a paycheck stub, tax forms, a business card, um, letterhead from your place of employment, an HR memo from your place of employment indicating what your title is. And again, your ballot designation has to be your prim primary occupation, vocation. Um, it cannot be a secondary. Um, and again, we need proof when you turn in your forms and you have to turn in all your forms together. If you have any questions about whether or not a ballot designation uh, is acceptable or what form of proof is acceptable, please call my office. We're happy to go over that before the deadline, preferably, um, so that we can give you an answer ahead of time in case we need to go back and um, find another designation that is legal or that you can provide proof of. This one uh, topic tends to generate a ton of questions. So again, if you have any concerns about your ballot designation or what is considered proper proof, please reach out and contact my office. We do run ballot designations by the city attorney. That has just been our standard practice. So they will be reviewing all ballot designations. Our review of your ballot designations is not a challenge. Um, please know that up front. We want you to be able to use a ballot designation that you are most comfortable with. We're not trying to challenge anybody, but we do require proper proof when we accept your ballot designation form. So does anybody have any questions before we move on from ballot designation? Okay, I don't see any. Tamla, can you advance the slide, please? So again, <clears throat> your ballot designation, no more than three words primary profession, vocation, occupation, must not mislead the voters. And we have a comprehensive guideline in the candidate handbook on this topic. Next slide, please. Here's some examples that we've used in the past, just to give you an idea. <clears throat> Businessman is, okay, thumbs up, city council member, no problem. Planning commissioner or businesswoman is not acceptable. Planning commissioner is an appointed position, not an elected position, so it cannot be used as a ballot designation. Businesswoman, however, can be used. And then goodwill ambassador is not a primary occupation vocation, so it cannot be used. That is a not good ballot designation. Next slide, please. So nomination papers. The nomination paper is where you gather signatures from registered voters within your district. You must gather at least 20 valid signatures of registered voters in your district. We recommend you get 30 just in case. There are plenty of times when people, <clears throat> excuse me, think that they are registered. They think that they live in your district or they may not know how to tell you that they are not registered um, within your district. So. We recommend getting 30 just in case uh, some of those 20 are not good signatures. One person must circulate your nomination paper and we encourage you to sign your own nomination paper. That seems to be a question we get. Yes, you may sign your own nomination paper. You should be the first person on that, that nomination paper. Um, <clears throat> we do do courtesy checks. So if you, want to email us, scan your nomination paper, email us your nomination paper, we will do a courtesy check to ensure that you have 20 valid signatures on your nomination paper before the end of nomination when you turn in your entire packet. If somebody signs your nomination paper, um, actually I take that back, that would not apply in this one, in this particular case since 
No, it would. So if somebody signs your nomination paper <clears throat> and they sign another candidate's nomination paper, whoever turns in their nomination paper first will receive that signature credit. So I'm not saying race to the finish line, but if you turn yours in first, you get that signature. So I would encourage everybody to turn in their nomination papers and their entire packet ahead of the deadline. Um, if you do not have 20 valid signatures on your nomination paper, we can issue you a supplemental nomination packet. And um, to, to get more signatures, we will only issue you one supplemental nomination for additional signatures. Um, so please, Ask the individuals who are signing your nomination paper if they are a valid registered voter within your district. And take advantage of our courtesy check. There's more information in section three of the handbook about nomination papers. Next slide, please. So your candidate statement form is also gonna be in your manila envelope and your candidate statement is the opportunity you have to reach out and tell people within your district about yourself and why you're running um, and what your values are. And the candidate statement is optional. It's 200 word document, and it will appear in the sample ballot booklet for a price. So there is a cost associated with having your candidate statement in the sample ballot booklet. The county gives us an estimate and we provide that estimate in the candidate handbook on page 4-4. That amount is due when you file your nomination packet. So please be aware that when you file all your paperwork, you will need to provide the payment for the estimated payment for the candidate statement. Um, there is additional fees if you want that candidate statement translated into Spanish. And the candidate statement is in column format in the sample ballot booklet. Keep in mind that when you format your candidate statement, it can push it into two columns if you have a lot of hard returns, a lot of bullets, a lot of double spacing in that candidate statement. Just be aware when you're formatting your candidate statement how that is going to look. Um, on the slide in front of you, you can see a candidate statement in English and it's about half of the column. When it's translated into Spanish, it's a little bit longer. Spanish tends to have more words um, to describe things. So if you have it translated into Spanish, it may be a little bit longer than English. Again, just for formatting purposes, keep that in mind. Uh, the measure example we have is you can see, it looks like it, it's formatted in a nice way, but with the signatures on the end, it pushed two columns. So again, I just wanna show an example of how things can look um, when they get pushed or don't have proper spacing, it can force it into two columns and the candidate statement pricing is based on the number of columns. So please keep that in mind when you are formatting your candidate statement. Uh, one of the questions we get a lot is, should my candidate statement be first person, third person? That is a choice that is completely up to you. Um, we've seen it both ways. So it just depends on what you want to write about yourself and what you want to tell your district about yourself, whether you want it to be in first person or not. In your candidate statement, you must refrain from political references. Um, this is a nonpartisan election. We are a local um, election for districts, so no references to political parties and no references to other candidates that may be running against you in this race. So please do not take this as an opportunity to say something disparaging about a fellow candidate, we will ask you to remove that from your candidate statement. We will also do a courtesy check on your candidate statement for the word count to make sure that it does not go over 200 words. If you'd like to submit that to us, we can help you out. Um, sometimes candidates like to play it really close to the line and we wanna make sure that we don't have to take out a word, a sentence, anything that you might think is critical for your candidate statement. So allow us to do that courtesy check for you. We will do a word count uh, ahead of filing the nomination packet. And if you need more information on your candidate statement, there, please refer to section four in the handbook. Is there any question on candidate statements?
All right, I don't see any. All right, next slide. So mass mailings. Mass mailings are a common uh, method to reach out to your community. And there are some rules around mass mailings. Any mass mailing that you send out over 200 pieces must be have your name, your address, city, committee ID number, the words paid for by, and they have to be, it has to be a minimum of a six point type and a color that contrasts with the background so it's easily legible. These are all requirements of the state. So if you have any questions about any mass mailings that you'd like to send out, please feel free to reach out to our office and we will be able to provide those answers to you or you can go to the FPDC website and see what their regulations are around mass mailings. Very important that you follow the guidelines that we have. Um, more information can be found in section seven of the handbook. Political signs are another area where we get frequent calls from the public about political signs. Mostly it's about where they can and cannot be placed. So political signs, it's a great way to advertise your name, what office you're running for in the district that you're running in. But please remember that they cannot be in public areas. Political signs can only be on private property. Public areas include telephone poles, street signs, trees, sidewalks, medians, parks, and just any place that's not private property. We get tons of calls about signs not being in the proper place. These signs are expensive. We do not want to have to throw away any of your political signs because they are not where they need to be. Take time to educate your staff, uh, any volunteers that may be working for your campaign about political signs and where they can and cannot be. Sometimes your volunteers get a little overzealous and they start putting those signs where they cannot be. I do not want another phone call this election cycle about a sign improperly posted on Lakewood and Willow Boulevard. Last election cycle, that was a hotbed of contention. That intersection caused a lot of stress. Um, it has to be on private property. <clears throat> private property can be a business. If a business agrees to put your sign in the window, that is completely fine. It cannot be on the telephone pole outside. It cannot be on that median. Um, I know it's a great traffic area, but it has to be on private property. So if anybody has any questions, if you have any concerns about political signs, or if you need a, a you feel a sign is improperly posted, you can call our office. Um, code enforcement number is also in the handbook, and we will be asking them to remove signs that are posted improperly in the city of Long Beach. Any questions on political signs? I don't see any in the chat, but if anybody wants to unmute themselves, if you're able and ask the question, feel free or raise hands. I don't, I don't really see any raised hands either. So just wanna make sure everybody has an opportunity to ask any questions as we're going through this. Okay, seeing none, we will go on to electioneering. So on election day, we do get calls about electioneering. It is illegal to try and persuade people to vote for a particular person, person within 100 feet of a vote center or drop box. This type of violation is considered a misdemeanor. If you see any of this type of activity at a voting location, please contact the county vote center worker. They are on site. They know what to do. They have tape measures. They can tape, uh, tape off and count 100 feet very quickly <clears throat> from the entrance of the vote center or the drop box to make sure that the people are well away from the vote center. If you see somebody with a t-shirt or a hat that has um, any political uh, advertising on it for this election, you can ask the vote center person to uh, make that person turn their t-shirt inside out, remove the hat to avoid any type of electioneering activity. So you may also call our office. I'm not saying that we will not be here on election day, but when you contact my office, it 
we have to contact the county and then the county contacts the vote center employee and that takes time. I would encourage you to go straight to the vote center worker so that they can make the correction right then and there and the problem does not linger for 20 or 30 minutes um, that it would take for us to contact the county and get that issue resolved. We do keep track of those kind of issues. So does the county. We try and um, get that resolved as soon as possible. We do not want to see any electioneering happening at any of the vote centers or drop boxes. Anybody have any questions around electioneering? Last thing I will say is that we do include a contact sheet in our handbook that has the phone number for the county and um, their office and their email so that if you have any concerns about electioneering on election day, you can also reach out to them. But the fastest and best thing to do to resolve the issue is go to the vote center employees who are there on site. Okay, next slide. So campaign finance and contribution limits. I know this is everybody's favorite topic. The contribution limit for the selection cycle is listed on 8-1. It is $500. There's also information on matching funds and expenditure ceilings. And if matching funds are accepted um, by you and a fellow candidate, um, all the information you're looking for is in section nine of the handbook. Matching funds is a very complex topic, and I'm more than happy to make an appointment to discuss the details of matching funds with any one of you. Um, for those of you new to matching funds, this may be your first election, you may be wondering what is matching funds. I'll give you a brief overview. In 1994, the city adopted the Long Beach Campaign Reform Act to ensure that individuals have a fair and equal opportunity to participate in municipal elective processes. To assist in providing a neutral source of campaign financing, the city offers matching funds. You must qualify for matching funds and adhere to the regulations if you accept matching funds. And you can accept matching funds for the primary and or the general election. This is again, a very complex topic. I encourage you to make an appointment. We can sit down or talk on the phone in detail about matching funds. Um, one thing I will say for those of you who have participated as a candidate in the past, um, and those of you who are new, matching funds, it takes a long time to process applications for matching funds. We do our very best to get through it as quickly as possible, but we have to do an internal review process and send those forms to an outside auditing firm. And then we receive that information back and process the matching fund application for a check. Please be patient with our office. We are doing our very best to get through it as fast as possible, but we do not have any control over the outside auditing firm and how long they take to review the applications. Any questions on campaign finance, contribution limits, and matching funds? On the slide before you is the calendar for filing your forms, your 460s, please be familiar with this calendar. If not you, um, I encourage all the candidates to have a treasurer. Your treasurers should be very familiar with this calendar. They should know when to file and what to file. These are the forms that will be reviewed by the Ethics Commission Ad Hoc Committee to go over and make sure that they everything is filed in a timely manner and that you have all the appropriate information and that you have not received more than you are able to receive, which is the $500 limit per election. And that is another question we get is, can we start fundraising for the general before the primary is completed? And the answer is no, you may raise money for the primary until you qualify for the general, you may not raise money for the general. And that is outlined in our municipal code. Okay, next slide.
of vote centers and vote by mail drop boxes. This should be very familiar to everybody by now. We've gone through a couple of elections where we've had vote centers and drop boxes. Um, let's see, you can now vote anywhere in LA County. Uh, we, you also should be getting a vote by mail ballot in the mail. And you can go to any vote center and drop off that vote by mail, or you can go to a vote center and vote in person if that is your preference. There will be 11 day and four day vote centers. The voting period is February 24th through March 5th. So the 11 day vote centers, there are fewer of them since they open 11 days early before the election day. And then when we get to four days before election day, more vote centers open up in LA County. Again, you can go to any one of the vote centers within LA County. You don't have to vote in Long Beach. Um, you can if that's convenient for you, but if you are out with family someplace else in LA County, you can go to any of those vote centers. You can take your friends and make it a party and go to any vote center in LA and have a good time and hopefully get everybody in your family and all your friends to vote with you. So the voting period again is February 24th to March 5th. We do have drop boxes for their vote by mail ballots all over Long Beach. Uh, you can also put it in any US mailbox. Um, the Postal Service mailbox. The vote um, drop boxes that the county provides, it's a direct route to the county. So that is the only difference. The United States Postal Service is completely acceptable. It does get to the county. The drop boxes are just fast tracking that ballot to go directly to the county. The county does have employees that comes and collects the vote by mail ballots from those drop boxes and takes them directly to their warehouse. So either one is fine, or you can drop it off at a vote center. If, you, if you're going and you see a vote center and it's more convenient, a vote center will take your vote by mail ballot as well. Any questions? Let's see. Oh, I see a question. Uh, is there anything being done about the ballot and ballot statement going out at the same time? Last election, the ballot was sent and a ballot statement did not come out for a few weeks. So unfortunately, we do not have control over when the county mails out the ballot and the sample ballot booklet. I wish that we could guarantee that the sample ballot booklet would be mailed before the ballots, but the vendor that the county works for mails out sample ballot booklets and ballots in batches and in waves. So LA County is a huge county and it just depends on when the wave of sample ballots is going out that your constituents might be in. So I can't guarantee that the sample ballot booklet is going out before the ballots, um, it just really depends on where your district is, what your, where your residents are in those waves that are being mailed out by the vendor. One thing, one new thing that I, I didn't, and I forgot to mention during the candidate statement portion, one new thing that the county is doing this year is they are offering online candidate statements. So in the past, we've only, uh, had kept the candidate statements up on our website during the public review period. This election cycle, the county has said that for a fee, and I think the fee is two sixty two hundred seventy nine dollars and sixty cents. You can have your candidate statement online on the county's website. We will be linking our website to the county's website so that residents who come to our website and get your candidate statement as well. I think this is a great opportunity for people who don't want to pay the you know, thousand dollars to have your candidate statement or whatever the fee might be in the sample ballot booklet. You can get your candidate statement online and in front of the, the residents that way. Um, this is the first year that they're offering it. So I'm excited to see how well that goes, but it will be up for the duration of the election cycle if you choose that option. And we will go over that uh, with every candidate when they come and file their nomination papers. I think it's, again, a terrific way to get your candidate statement out there and keep it out there during the election 
cycle if you do not want it in the sample ballot booklet or to ensure that the voters have it before they vote um, if they're getting their ballot before their sample ballot booklet. And next slide. <clears throat> so if anybody has any questions, I will take those. Just as a reminder, all the forms are due to the city clerk by the close of the nomination period, which is Friday, December 8th, except for Council District 8, which is the 13th. All your forms are due at the same time. I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have before they come and file their nomination packet. We encourage you to make an appointment so that we can block off the time that we need to work with you. It does take about an hour to go through all of the forms with a candidate and ensure that everything has been filled out properly and accept payment for your candidate statement. If you are going to be providing a candidate statement, again, candidate statements are optional. Any questions? I see that somebody had a question in the chat about scheduling an appointment. For right now, absolutely, we will have somebody assist you as soon as the candidate workshop is over. I like it, getting in here early. Are there any other questions? I invite any of the panelists um, who are here, if you have thought of something or wanna make another comment, any of my staff, if I've missed any of the points that we wanted to go over with any of the candidates, please take this opportunity to jump in. All right, if anybody has any additional questions that they think of after this candidate workshop is over, please feel free to email us. We will be posting an FAQ on our website so that uh, everybody who was unable to attend can see the questions and what the response was. We'll also be posting a copy of this whole presentation on our website. So if you know a candidate who was unable to attend or if you just wanna come back and review this material, we will have it on our website for all of you to take a look at during the election cycle. All right, seeing no other questions. I wanna thank everybody for attending today. I know you're taking time out of your busy schedule to, to hear our spiel about being a candidate. We just wanna help you through the process. I, am, I appreciate everybody participating in local government. And I know this is just the first step in the process, but it takes a lot of effort to even get to this point and to think about serving your community. It's not an easy task being a candidate. Um, we, we really appreciate that you're volunteering your time and energy over the next several months to make democracy work. And good luck to every single candidate out there. If you have any questions, please feel free to call our office. <laughs>